Hey everyone, welcome back to another video. In today's video, we're gonna talk about basic life support and different concepts that you need to know in order for you to help someone who is in a critical state. If you wanna gain more information about nursing or to improve your knowledge about the healthcare industry, please consider subscribing down below. I upload a video every single week and you don't want to miss them. Please also consider giving this video a thumbs up. It helps the YouTube algorithm and helps other people watch my videos. So let's get on with basic life support. So basic life support is essentially a way of knowing how to react when someone's condition deteriorates significantly. You have to have a systematic way of being able to assess that person's situation and provide them with the proper interventions and care to hopefully save their life or to give them what they need to retain their, as much life as possible. So since many of you are probably gonna take this basic life support course, I won't go over all the small little details the course goes over, Instead, what I'm going to focus on is talking about the major concepts that you need to know, both from a theory perspective and a clinical perspective or a practical perspective. So the first thing you need to know is how to react when someone's in cardiac arrest. So what does that exactly mean? That means that the patient is unconscious and they don't have a pulse. So in order for you to go in and safely assess them, there's, a certain, there's certain steps which I'll list right here that you need to know and memorize when um, assessing a patient. This is, these steps here that I've listed are very important for you to memorize because not only will they test you, that on, test you about it on the theory portion of the exam, but in a real life situation, it's also important to know. So the first thing you want to do, like it states here, is to assess the environment safety. You know, your safety takes priority over the patients in that situation. Once you've assessed the safety and you found, uh, once you've assessed the environment and found that it is safe for you to go in and assess the patient, you go in and you alert and see if the patient is alert. You, you know, hit their shoulders, you know, shout in their face like, hey, are you awake? Can you hear me? You know, try and get a response. If you don't get a response, you wanna go ahead and palpate their carotid or you wanna palpate their radial pulse. Typically, people go to go for the radial pulse. It's easier to find. Um, all those people say carotid's easier to find too. So I don't know, just choose a pulse. You just have to check to see if they have the pulse. Once you identify that they don't have a pulse, right you want to start CPR right away and once you start CPR you need to look around and see if there's any bystanders uh, around you that may be able to assist you so you need to firstly ask somebody to call 911 and activate the emergency response team secondly you want to ask someone to grab the AED or if you're in a healthcare setting, in a hospital, you wanna go and ask them to get the crash cart and put the pads on one on their chest, one on their upper chest, and one on their below their, their nipple line underneath their uh, opposite chest. That will allow them to be uh, either paced or they might give them a shock, depending on what the AED says. But that, that's stuff you don't really need to know. So essentially, you put the you ask somebody to call 911 and get an AED and or put the pacemaker or put the defibrillator pads on. This will allow uh, both the the monitor, if you have a defibrillator on, this will allow the defibrillator to monitor their heart rhythm and see if their heart rhythm is a, is at a shockable state. Um, the AED doesn't tell you a rhythm strip. Instead, it will automatically analyze the person's rhythm. Um, so it's very important that you turn on the AED, put the pads on, turn on the AED, and while someone's putting on the AED pads, you have to continue doing CPR. That's also very important that they test you on, is making sure that you always continue doing CPR until the AED prompts you to stop. And it will say like, 
analyzing rhythm now, don't touch the patient, something like that. And you essentially wanna stop doing CPR and let the AED analyze the rhythm. So another part of the BLS course that they really want you to know is the compression to ventilation ratio. You have to do 30 compressions to two ventilations. And if you're alone in an environment and there's nobody there to help you, you need to be able to, you know, properly give compressions and give two ventilations. Now, both of these actions have specific things that you need to know. So for compressions, you have to make sure that your one, the rhythm that you uh, press down on the patient's chest is correct. And two, you need to make sure that the depth is far enough in order for you to make the heart contract. And three, you need to make sure that you allow for the, the chest to recoil or the heart to recoil back up. That's because you wanna make sure that first you contract the heart to pump blood everywhere to, its ex to the person's extremities, but you also wanna allow the heart to fill up. Think about diastole and systole. You need to press down to have systole happen and you need to let it relax to let, to let your heart have a diastole period. In order for, your, for you to save that life, that person needs to perfuse blood and you need to be able to provide high quality CPR. The next thing, you, the next action that you need to do properly is ventilation. So when you're doing 30 compressions, there's, you do the 30 compressions, after it's done, you immediately put on, or you immediately go on to the uh, mask that you have on, on the patient. Um, sometimes it's an ambu bag, sometimes it's a mouthpiece, whatever the case may be. But you need to make sure that you uh, give, a, give the ventilation slowly over one second, but also not too much. So if you have an ambu bag, um, you need to press, you don't need to squeeze it all the way. You have to just press almost like halfway through in order to see the chest rise. So when you're giving ventilations, the first thing you wanna do is make sure that you press on the ambu bag, not too hard, not too fast, but enough to see the chest rise, and you wanna give a one second pause between the second ventilation. This will allow the person to have proper air into their lungs. The next concept that's really important for you to know is the automatic external defibrillator. Now this is a device that essentially shocks the patient, essentially being able to save their life. It is very important that you know how to work with the automatic external defibrillator, where to put the pads on different patients, so on a uh, pediatric patients, on an adult patient, and on an infant. And you also have to know what the purpose of the automatic external defibrillator is and also expect certain prompts that it's gonna tell you. So I'll kind of talk about the automatic external defib defibrillator or AED, and I'll give you kind of like a, a summary points of what's important for you to know. So the first thing you gotta know is that the pads go on the, just underneath one of the shoulders and one, un one underneath the left chest. Next, you wanna be able to identify situations where you don't put the pads on. So in general, you always put the pads on, but there's a few situations where you wanna alter the placement of the pads. One of the situations is if they have a pacemaker. You do not wanna put the defibrillator pad on a pacemaker. The second thing that you have to know is the fact that if someone has a nitroglycerin patch or for that matter, any medication patch that you see, you do not want to put the pad on the patch. That's because you want to make sure that it's able to give a shock and essentially it will compromise the shock that it gives. So let's go on to what an AED actually does. So essentially an automatic external defibrillator or an AED 
shocks the body's heart and stops the, stops the heart from being in a lethal heart rhythm, which, which is pulseless ventricular tachycardia or ventricular fibrillation. If your heart is in these two rhythms, the AED will automatically identify it and provide your body or provide the person with a shock. These rhythms are very lethal and when you're in that rhythm, it's not sustainable for life. So the AED shocks the cardiac electrical system that your heart is in in hopes of getting it out or resetting the heart's electrical conduction system to prevent it from further being in that rhythm. Another important point that the BLS course likes to test you on is the fact of the patient's age. Now, if you're ever uncertain of the patient's age, you should always put on adult AED pads. So if you're not sure if the patient's above the age of eight years old, you should always put on the adult AED pads. However, if the patient is below eight years old and you know that, let's say the mother is there and the person goes under cardiac, uh, goes into a cardiac arrest state, then you obviously put on the modified smaller AED pads. On the pads themselves, it will tell you exactly where to put, place them for a pediatric patient. So you just follow the prompts on the AED pad. So the last thing I would like to mention is three different situations where you stop doing CPR. In general, doing CPR and stopping CPR are really big deals because that's what's giving the patient the most chance of success. So the first reason you should stop doing CPR is whenever the AED tells you analyzing rhythm now. You should not be doing CPR because it essentially is trying to make sure that the heart is not in a shockable state. The other way you should stop, the, only, the other reason you should stop doing CPR is when you're about to shock a patient. That means, this is a, this is a part where they love to test you on, that means that when a patient is uh, getting, if the AED is being charged, you need to continue doing CPR, but right before the patient gets shocked, you need to stop CPR. Also, once a patient is shocked with the AED, you need to immediately stop, start doing CPR again. So remember, right before you shock, you stop CPR. Immediately after shock, you start CPR. These are very important points and they love to test you on that. Another important fact that they love to test you on is the amount of time you should take for checking someone's pulse. So let's say you do CPR 30 to two, and which is 100 to 120 beats per minute. That's also something they love to test you on is the amount of beats per minute you should be doing CPR. So let's say after two minutes is up, you do the 30 to two, and now it's time for a pulse check. The pulse check should not take longer than 10 seconds maximum. I'll say that again. The pulse check should not take longer than 10 seconds. Next, I wanna talk about three terms that the BLS course wants to make sure you know. The first is agonal gasps. Agonal gasps are not considered actual breaths. So anytime you see the word agonal gasps, they want to make sure that you know that this is not actually an adequate amount of air to ventilate someone's lungs. It is not an actual breath. So if you ever see somebody that's having agonal gasps, you need to check their pulse. So I'll cut through a clip right now to show you what an agonal gasp is. So the next one, next term they really want you to know is a draw, is a <laughs> draw, is a jaw thrust maneuver. 
Essentially, you just move their chin up like this and that will open up their airway. Airway is really important. You need to make sure that their airway is secure and they have a patent airway. To do that, you need to look in their mouth and in order for you to um, assess their airway or if you see that you know the, the ventilations you're giving are not adequate to make the chest rise, maybe that could signal that something is wrong with the airway. So the first thing you wanna do is do a jaw thrust maneuver. So let's say a jaw thrust maneuver is not working and you're doing CPR, two minutes is up, you do a pulse check, they have no pulse, and you notice that their chest isn't rising. The next thing you wanna do is look for an advanced airway placement. That could be an LMA, or it could not be an advanced air placement. It could be an OPA or an NPA. Essentially, those are devices that they insert into, so an OPA is an oral pharyngeal airway device. It's basically, I'll have a picture here. Basically, they put something in a patient's mouth to secure that the when you do the ventilations, air is going through to their lungs. The NPA is something that goes through their nose and essentially it makes sure that air is going through the nose. An LMA is considered an advanced placement because you need to make sure that you're in the right place and it has a little ball that inflates to keep the trachea open. I'll show a picture of it here and I'll, that will hopefully clarify what an LMA is. The next thing they want you to know is communication. They use a term called closed loop communication. This is very important because if you're having a situation where a patient is actively dying or is essentially dead, you need to have good communication amongst healthcare professionals in order for you to provide effective life-saving care. Nothing's worse than going into a, a patient that's dying, who's in a critical state, and it's chaotic, there's no good communication. So the BLS wants you to use a, um, a communication technique called closed loop, tech, a closed loop communication. And what that essentially means is you have a team leader, that team leader lays eyes on the person that they are speaking with and gives them a, um, a direct and um, understandable command and the person replies back saying that they understand. So something like, hey, simple fit nurse, give the patient two ventilations now. And I say, two ventilations given. Stuff like that is called closed loop communication and you need to be able to know how to do that. Another important component they love to test you on is witnessed and unwitnessed cardiac arrest. If a patient goes under cardiac arrest and it was unwitnessed, then the first thing you wanna do is, like I said earlier in the video, assess the scene safety, make sure the patient is unresponsive so tap on their shoulder shout at them then check their pulse if no pulse is present immediately start CPR you should do five rounds of CPR before going and asking for help so that's something that's very important that they love to test you on unwitnessed cardiac arrest and how many rounds of CPR you need to do before asking for help next I want to talk about the modifications to CPR or basic life support in pediatric and infant populations. So in general, no matter what the patient is or who they are for that matter, you should always provide 100 to 100 beats per minute, no matter what. Another concept that is different is the fact that um, an infant with a pulse that is 60 or less is considered car under cardiac arrest. So you should start CPR. 
This is something that is really tested on the BLS exams and the practical portion. You, know, you need to be able to know where to check the pulse. For an infant, you check the infant's pulse through either the brachial or the femoral. Those are the two areas where you check um, an infant's pulse. Another important part is the infant bag valve mask ventilations. So you need to make sure that the patient's head is not tilted back if too far if they're an infant. That could actually occlude their airway and prevent them for, from getting ventilations. Next, I want to talk about the depths of compression for infants, pediatric patients, and adults. That's something that I'll have listed here and you just simply have to remember. Another difference in pediatric and infant patients is the way you do compressions. For an infant, you want to be able to do compressions with your thumbs like this. But that's only if there's two people there. If there's one person there, you use your two fingers like this to do CPR on their chest. If it's a pediatric patient, you want to use either the palm of your hand to do CPR or you can do both hands. Also, keep in mind that when you're doing CPR, you want to landmark just above the xiphoid process or below the nipple line. That's the sweet spot of where the heart is and where you should be performing CPR on any patient. Anyways guys, I hope you enjoyed the video. If you did, please consider giving it a thumbs up and let me know if you're writing the BLS exam or doing the BLS course. I'd love to hear some feedback on ways I can improve. Maybe I'll make another video. Thank you very much for watching.